taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Paul Denier Frankston Serial Killer In 1972, on the 14th of April, in Campbelltown, New South Wales, Paul Charles Denier was born to Maureen and Anthony Denier. The middle child of five boys and one girl, Denier didn't have the greatest of starts after being dropped on the head as a baby. When he was nine years old the family moved to Victoria, and young Paul Denier struggled to adapt to his new school, finding the other children to be unfriendly. During this time he began to fashion his own toys, which would include clubs, knives, and slingshots. Another peculiar attribute of Denier as a young child, was the fact that he would disembowel his sister's stuffed animals, and even more disturbingly, he murdered the family cat when he was 10 by hanging it from a tree. It is also reported that he killed and cut up two goats from a nearby paddock, so all the warning signs were there. At some point he was sexually abused by one of his elder brothers, though no charges were filed and the matter was dealt with by the family. Due to his excessive weight, Denier struggled to make friends and was a social outcast, making the young boy spiteful and angry. At the age of 12 he started on his life of crime by stealing a car, and at 13 he was charged with willful damage and hoax, after calling the fire brigade to an event he had tried to instigate. By the age of 14 he told detectives after his capture, he already knew he was going to be a killer. At 15 years of age Denier was in trouble again, after forcing a boy to masturbate in front of some young children. He had now committed acts of violence against animals, including killing, and forced someone into a sexual act through intimidation. Couple this with the petty crimes and the sexual abuse he suffered, and it seems like Denier's early life was taken straight from the serial killer's handbook. Throughout his teenage years, his peers called him John Candy, after the comedian who played in the Blues Brothers. This was due to him being 6 feet tall and weighing in excess of 120 kilograms. At the age of 20, Denier had a girlfriend named Sharon Johnson and a job at a Safeway supermarket. The couple moved in together and Denier must have appreciated Johnson much more than he did other human life, as he said later in statements that she was someone that he would never harm. Soon however, Denier found himself unemployed. This was after deliberately running a train of trolleys he was collecting into a mother and her child. In February of 1993, Paul Denier decided to break into his neighbor's flat, she was a lone woman with child, but fortunately she was not home. After gaining entry to the property, Denier murdered his neighbor's cat and its litter of kittens with a homemade knife that he had brought along. Then, using the blood of the slaughtered kittens, he wrote threats on the walls, stating that he would kill the woman as well. Denier was never caught for this crime and would admit in questioning later, that his intention had been to kill his neighbor. After this twisted crime, which had a personal aspect to it as he knew the woman in question, Denier would only attack women whom he didn't know. The reason being, was that he didn't care who he killed, just as long as it was a woman. In his own words he stated that he, just wanted to take a life because I felt like mine had been taken many times, and that he also, hated women in general. On June the 11th, 1993, Paul Denier would commit his first murder. 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens had just left the bus on Cranbourne Road, Ling Warren, when Denier approached her from behind and pushed an aluminium pipe with a wooden handle into the small of her back. He then told the terrified teenager that it was a gun and that he would shoot her if she didn't do as he asked. After forcing Stevens into Lloyd Park, Denier strangely allowed the girl to relieve herself whilst respecting her dignity by turning aside, before strangling her into unconsciousness with his bare hands. After this he stabbed her in the throat repeatedly, before picking her up and carrying her a few steps. He then threw Elizabeth back on the ground and stood on her neck until she was dead. After the murder, Denier took the teenager's body to a drain where it would later be found. 
Although there were no signs of sexual assault, Stevens was found topless, yet Denier never admitted to undressing her. Less than a month later on 8 July, 1993, Denier attempted to kidnap Ross Zatoth as she was walking close to Seaford Station. Sticking with his same modus operandi, Denier snuck up on the woman from behind. This time however, he placed his gun to her head and placed a hand over her mouth, which she bit on hard, right down to the bone. After a tussle, Toth managed to escape into traffic and flagged down an oncoming car, which only left Denier the option to flee. Denier's night would not be over however, and after catching a train to the next stop down at Kane Cook Station, he disembarked and continued his hunt for a victim. Deborah Freem had just nipped to the shop for some milk and left her car open momentarily. That was all it took for Paul Denier to seize on the opportunity. Sneaking into the back seat next to the baby carrier, the murderer awaited the return of his victim. When Deborah returned to the car, Denier pushed his fake gun into her side and told her to drive to Karim Downs, which she immediately did as she wanted to get back home to where her 12-day-old baby was waiting. Once they arrived at the site, Denier ordered Deborah out of the vehicle and into a paddock, where he strangled her with some cord amongst the trees. Once she was unconscious, Denier then stabbed her in the neck multiple times before deciding he wanted to see the size of her breasts, after which, enticed by the bare flesh, he stabbed her once in the stomach. After covering Deborah's body with bushes, Denier drove away in her vehicle and abandoned it near his home. The body was discovered four days later and no signs of sexual assault were seen. The final victim to fall foul to Denier's maniacal spree, would do so on 30 July, 1993. 17-year-old Natalie Russell was riding her bike home from high school when she caught the attention of Denier. As she rode down a shortcut near Sick Road, she was unaware that Denier had been there previously and cut numerous holes in the fence to aid his hideous crimes. As she glided along the pathway, Denier grabbed her and pulled her through one of the holes he had created. This time Denier didn't have his homemade gun to keep her quiet, so he held a knife to her throat and in doing so, cut a small piece of his thumb off, though it didn't prevent him from carrying out his despicable acts. The young girl knew exactly who she was dealing with after the other horrifying murders had dominated the news, so in response to this, pleading for her life. She offered Denier sex in return for her freedom. Denier however, was not sexually motivated and he was disgusted by her offer. He then made her lie down while he held the knife to her eye, leaning over her, overbearing her with his eyes. After tormenting his young victim he looped a leather strap around her neck and tried to strangle her with it, snapping it in the process. All the while, Natalie attempted to scream and struggle. After telling her to stop repeatedly, Denier eventually slashed her throat and put his hand inside where he twisted her trachea, cutting off her air supply. He then cut at her head, almost taking it clean off, before kicking her body to make sure she was dead as he left. When her body was discovered, there was no indication of sexual assault. Paul Denier's infamous time as a free man was coming to an end however, as the piece of skin he had cut from his thumb in the Russell attack would come back to haunt him. During the events, his yellow Toyota Corona had apparently been witnessed at all three crime scenes, and so the police had left a note under his door asking him to attend the station as part of routine questioning. When Denier's girlfriend Sharon Johnson had seen it, she had called police to tell them that they would come in to help. She had no idea that Denier was responsible. When the couple came into the station, Paul Denier was cool and didn't act like he had anything to worry about. He provided alibis stating that he was usually waiting for his girlfriend, which Johnson backed up. He even acted relatively unperturbed when they took his DNA for testing. Throughout his murderous spree, the skin from his thumb was the only evidence he had left behind. 
Ross Zatoth couldn't give a detailed description as she had been running for her life, and the only other significant aspect was the location of his car. The calm exterior was all for show however, and knowing that his days were numbered, Paul Denier handed himself in before the DNA results were even returned. Denier was arrested and interrogated immediately by Detective Darren O'Loughlin, in which, he provided details of all three murders. The questioning began at 4 a.m. and continued for over 12 hours. He was then kept in police custody until his trial. On 15 December in 1993, Paul Denier pleaded guilty to all charges in the Supreme Court of Victoria, to Justice Frank Vincent. Clinical psychologist Ian Joblin was brought before the court, and he explained that after analyzing Denier in custody, he found him to be a sadist, and that he found pleasure in murdering women. It was also noted that he didn't show any outward signs of remorse for his actions whilst he was being interrogated. Paul Charles Denier received three terms of life imprisonment without parole, and eight years for the attempted abduction. On July 29, 1994, Paul Denier appealed to the Supreme Court of Victoria and was allowed a 30-year non-parole period in prison. It means that he may one day be able to leave jail and be released back into the community. Paul Denier has since applied for gender reassignment surgery, which he was denied. He is also asked to be provided with makeup to wear in jail. This has also been denied as it would have to be taxpayer funded.